gentlemen, welcome here at Fuji. Now we're going to see a presentation held by Ms. Lee Barris from USA. Lee Barris is a photo illustrator working in Hollywood. He has been involved in commercial photography for the last 35 years. He started working with computer imaging about 21 years ago after being introduced to the Quantum paper system. He currently works with digital as well as conventional photography in conjunction with computer graphics to create images for use in advertising, commercial graphics and multimedia. He has also been involved with cons consulting and training activities for numerous corporate clients. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Lee Barrett. Hello everybody. How are you doing today? This is my uh, my Fuji kit. Yeah. Camera and three lenses. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Anyway, um, I have been mostly working in my career in entertainment industry, doing print advertising, mostly for movie posters. So I thought I'd share uh, a few things here with you. Um, this is probably my most famous movie poster that I worked on, uh, and I've won more awards than any other. Um, but the, my job on this was to take a picture of the moth. Okay, the easiest job I ever had. I have no idea that we're going to use it this way. Uh, I'll share a little bit of trivia about this image. The death's head marking on the back of the moth is actually sort of an homage to Salvador Dali. It's made up of women. Uh, now, originally this was a, these were nudes, but the American Censor Board, the MPAA, decided that you cannot have nudes on a movie poster, so we had to retouch the little hem lines, neck lines on the body suits. So they weren't nude, they were wearing a body suit. That's kind of code word in Hollywood. If you hear that, it means they were nude. Anyway, it passed. Um, I did primarily my, my job was shooting body doubles. This was my niche, and like 95% of the time, if you see a, a, an, an actor or actress on a movie poster, in this case, this is a billboard, uh, and it's not really them from the neck down. Uh, this one was particularly difficult because we had to find a body double that could do all this really athletic stuff, uh, but the, the the girl we found to play Angelina Jolie wasn't full, wasn't enough. So actually we had to, this was a whole Frankenstein job. All these images composited from several parts. And uh, the breasts actually did come from Angelina, but none of it, the rest of the body was another person entirely. So I was doing a lot of this stuff with, uh, very early on, I was started shooting digitally. I uh, was using a, a medium format digital back. Uh, and um, these were only useful in the studio. So if I had to go and shoot on location, it was kind of difficult. And I was really looking for uh, a digital camera that could, could do that. Now, back in the day, the first really viable DSLR that could capture high enough quality and actually be used on these movie posters was a Fuji S2. It was a six megapixel uh, camera. And I love that camera because it, I, I could shoot it sort of untethered. I could go out and do a little more extreme situations. Uh, I'm, this picture here, this, this movie poster, 1993. This was the, the blue eye you see there was the first digitally captured image used on a movie poster. And this happens to be right before I got my S2. So uh, up until this time, the, the studios did not believe that digital was high enough res. And so they, would not, they just would not use it for a movie poster. These were mostly images from 35 millimeter slides. Well, I took this eye picture, and it really was uh, from a actually fairly primitive camera, Kodak DCS 200 and we had to blur it and add a little noise to it so that it would match the scanned film. From this point on, it, the studios became very interested in digital capture. 
And so all of my work then started incorporating digital capture. I got my Fuji S2, and I was shooting this kind of stuff in the Fuji. We did billboards and bus shelters with a six megapixel camera. So I learned a long time ago that megapixels don't necessarily mean uh, that you have the highest quality necessarily. Um, this is another image I, I did for National Geographic. This appeared in the October 1991 edition. This was a very early uh, Photoshop composite. It's one chimpanzee, and he's working on uh, sort of simian versions of Shakespeare. These are also the prototypes of what would then become the IMAP. So, uh, this was quite a job. I had to do a lot of compositing to get the cast shadows to be just right and, and make it convincing. Um, okay, so fast forward many years later. I've been shooting. I, I, I ended up migrating to a Canon DSLRs, and I, had, I used them extensively throughout my career. And then I had uh, uh, a, a trip coming up to go to Italy to just as a vacation to to celebrate a friend's retirement party. And I didn't want to bring all my camera gear. I'm not really a travel photographer. So all of my gear is oriented towards studio and, and very extensive kind of productions. And I was looking for something that would be lightweight that I could have fun with. And I, I got a Fuji X Pro 1. And this was my kit. So I had Fuji X Pro 1 with the three lenses, the three prime lenses, 18, 35, and, and uh, a 60 millimeter macro, and they all fit in here, along with uh, my string tripod. So I, I, I love this thing. This is, this is like a little string tripod thing. You, you step on it, and you can go to museums where they don't allow you to bring a, a tripod in. You can just step on it, pull up, and it, it totally steadies your, your thing. So I'm all into the the minimal approach here. So I was having a lot of fun, and not, you know, not really thinking much of like, oh, I'm going to get great, fantastic shots. Uh, I, I was mostly kind of looking to just take the, the kind of vacation snapshots. And when I got back, and I started looking at these files, I, I initially I, I could only see the JPEGs because the, the the raw processor wasn't available yet in camera raw. I'm looking at the JPEGs going, oh my god. I look at the detail of this thing. It, it's just awesome. And uh, I'm, I'm really, you know, this became my favorite camera, this little rangefinder camera. It's kind of a hybrid viewfinder, not really a rangefinder, but it was very cool. Uh, I never thought I would fall in love with an electronic viewfinder. And after this experience now, that's all I want to do. I just want to look at the electronic viewfinder because I can really get a preview of what I'm going to get at the moment I take the picture. I stop chimping. You know, I stop looking at the back of the camera. Um, so I was just, this was just like me walking around and just seeing something in interesting. I could, I could really just sort of, without really investing a lot of time and effort, just capture really stunning images or simple images, just capturing the quality of light, really enjoyed it. Little found scenes, I, I sort of renewed my, my love of just taking pictures, because for my whole career I've been a, an image maker, I've been creating images, and uh, this was just very, very enjoyable experience. So this is my introduction to the, the Fuji system, and I became extremely excited about the X-T1 because then, now this becomes like a professional system, complete professional system, and since I got the X-T1, I didn't touch my Canon gear at all. Really, really enjoying it. What I'm going to talk about now, I'm not going to show any more of my, my images. You can go to my website to see uh, lots of pictures if you'd like. But I'm going to share with you an, an actually a creative technique with the Fuji X-T1 that takes advantage of the iPhone app that, that comes with this system. And I like to call this one-man studio light painting. 
So now I, I, I started off my career, before I got into motion picture advertising, I was a still life photographer. And I hadn't done it in years, and now I'm coming back and it's reinvigorating me. Uh, I'm really enjoying a whole new approach to still life, taking advantage of the Fuji camera remote app, which allows me to completely control the camera from my iPhone. So setting this up is simplicity in itself. I mean, it's really, really wonderful. You, on the camera, you set the camera to Wi-Fi mode, so it starts broadcasting, and you pick the network here, right? And then you launch the camera mode app, and now you have a bunch of options. So you can actually browse your camera, you can do geotagging, you can do all kinds of stuff. But the thing that I was mostly interested in was the, the remote control. So we just click this button, and now we're in this remote control mode. I can see the live view from the camera. I can control everything on the camera, the f-stops, the shutter speeds, and the big red button is where I take the picture. So my strategy now for this approach, this is my light kit. You'll notice the, this is my lighting kit. This is a little cheap LED flashlight. That's it. I have the, I have the, the camera in my hand, the, the phone in my hand, the camera's on a tripod. So my idea is I'm going to take multiple photos using the flashlight to light the flowers the way I want. So here, this is me. I'm ready to do my first exposure. The beauty of having the, the live view of the camera in my palm of my hand is I can walk up to the subject where I'm going to do my light painting. And I don't have to touch the camera. So this is kind of what I see on the camera, the, the effect of the lighting. So I can see and then make a little adjustment and do another exposure with the light in a little bit different direction. Move around to another exposure of light in a bit different direction. So what I'm doing is I'm opening the shutter for about five seconds and painting the light off. So I'm going to show you a series of exposures here. So these are the different directions. I'm just walking around this, uh, these flowers and lighting from different angles. And my thought is now I'm going to blend all of these separate shots together to create a combined effect and then have very absolute control over the intensity and the direction of the light in individual layers. And so I'm going to create something like this. I'm going to actually go right into Photoshop now and show you how I do this. Would you like to see that? Okay. So, here we go, into Photoshop. Um, the, this, the idea, in case you haven't done this, is you, you select your multiple shots that you want to open up as layers. Now, because all of these shots were taken from the camera, I haven't even touched the camera, so there's no opportunity for it to move out of registration. Each one of these shots is in perfect registration. So we go up here to, I'm in Bridge now, but you can do this in Lightroom as well. Go to Tools, Photoshop, load files into Photoshop layers. So it opens all these files. I think I have 12 or 13 files here. So I, I, I open them up into Photoshop, and they all come in in this layer stack, and each each layer is stacked on top of the other. You can see here all these different exposures, different lighting exposures. So I'm going to go down to the bottom here. And what I, what I do is I start from the bottom up. And I, I want to put a black layer at the bottom because I'm going to just keep adding light. So I've got the, the bottom layer highlighted. I'm going to go here to uh, make a solid color layer. Okay, so I'll make a solid color black layer and drag that to the bottom. This now is my new background is black. Okay, so now here's the first trick. I'm going to be, if you pay attention, I'm going to be giving away some magic tricks here, my best magic tricks, and I'm giving it to you for free. Okay, so here we go. First one, I'm going to use blending options. This is, a, this is a feature here uh, in Photoshop that hardly anybody uses, but under the layer options flyway menu, I have blending options. 
This is the layer blend mode, but these are some extra blending options. So I'm going to select that. And if you notice here, uh, in the middle of the dialog, it says advanced blending. And I have the channels checked. Okay, so if I uncheck the blue and the green, this layer is now only going into the red channel. So it's red. And since it's a layer, I can add a layer mask. So I'm just going to add a white layer mask to it. Let me get my, my brush here. And I can subtract what I don't want to see. So right now, I'm really only interested in that shadow on the background. So I'm going to just paint with black into the layer mask here to hide this part. I'm just going to hide the flower, because I really just want to put something in the background. I can kind of, oops, lost my brush here for a second. And I can sort of feather, shape, and, and just use exactly the area of the image that, that I want. So I just want this little kind of spotlight on the background. Let's keep going. Next image. Okay, so blending options again. Let's put this in the green channel this time. So I uncheck the red and the blue. Now I'm going into the green. Again, a layer mask. I make a white layer mask. Brush with black to hide the parts that I don't want to see. So I'm brushing this away. So this is sort of like, you know, I can, I can get the light to do whatever I want in this individual layer. And so now I've got kind of an interesting thing in the background. Let's go one more. Okay, so we've used red and green. Let's, uh, well, let's put this into the green too. So, because we're gonna do something now, I'm just applying these in normal mode. If I'm using normal mode and I do my blending options, it now replaces what I had in the green channel before. So. I need to get both of those to be in the same shot. So instead of normal mode, I'm going to screen this in. So by screening, I'm adding light onto the underlying layers. So I'm adding it, instead of replacing that green channel, I'm adding more green light into the image. Okay, finally, I've got one more here that's lit on the background, and we're gonna put that into the blue channel. Another, a shortcut to doing that is to double click on the clear area in that layer. So if I just double click on this, this little area here, you can see the little icon represents that there's blending options. So if I double click here, I get the blending options and we'll uncheck green and red and so we'll have blue. Okay, now just to organize my work, I'm gonna collect all these layers and put them in a little folder so that I can treat them all as the background, just one, one thing. So I highlight all those layers, and we're gonna go new group from layers. So I'm making a layer group. We'll call that background, or just BG, because I can't spell. And now, this, this background here, that represents everything that's behind the flowers. Now everything I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna be adding white light to build up the lighting on the flowers. So here's my first one. What I'll do here for this, this layer is turn it to screen right away. So you can see now I'm screening the light on top of the underlying layers, but I don't necessarily want to use all of that. So uh, again, I can add a layer mask, get black paint, and uh, I, mean, I don't like this light up here. I really don't like this, this red flower and a little bit of that. So we'll, we'll just paint this off. Because I have other layers that I'm going to use to light those elements. So I'm just going to paint all that off. And we'll paint all this off. Okay, so that's the only light I want to have in this layer. Next, okay, I want, I want to use for these. So here's another way, instead of making a white layer mask, 
I can hold down Option or Alt and get a black layer mask. So I hold down Option here on the Mac, Alt on the PC. I click on my layer mask icon. I get a black layer mask that hides that whole layer. So now, instead of erasing what I don't want to see, I paint with white just to see just the area that I want to see right here. So now I'm kind of painting with light where I want the, the light to go. Okay, let's keep building it. So here I have this layer. Let's screen this in. Uh, now it's sort of the same thing here. It's, it's adding a little bit too much light down here. So let's hide it, option. Black layer mask and painting with white. Uh, I want to add that. Um, maybe this. That's it. Okay, now I know I want to get this red flower in there. So we'll screen. Use a black layer mask to hide it. And only going to paint the white where that flower is. Okay, next layer. Are you getting the idea how easy this is? I mean, I'm doing really complex lighting because I, I just sort of lit all these different directions and now I'm just, now I'm composing the light. Now I'm really putting the light exactly where I want it. Um, again, we'll hide that. Let's, let's screen it first. I can screen or use light. They're slightly different. Sometimes if I use light, it's a little more contrast because it doesn't blend with the existing lighting. So if I don't want it to blend, I, I would use light. But we'll hide it and then paint back in right in there. Here's, a, here's one that I want to use for this, these flowers. Screen or, or light. So see if, see if you can see the difference. So here's screen. Here's lighten. Uh, it's it's a little more contrasty because it just substitutes. So if it's lighter than the underlying layer, then Photoshop uses that. If it's not lighter than the underlying underlying layer, then it doesn't use it. So it's essentially replacing the darker parts of the underlying layer instead of blending in. So it lighting will tend to look a little more contrast. So. Uh, We'll hide it, just paint it in up there. Okay, we're getting close. I have two more layers. There's this one. So let's screen. Let's see what that does. Screen or lighten. I think I'll use lighten, and uh, we'll just paint again in just where I want it. Okay, and last one I want to get inside that flower. So I just want just the center of the flower, and then you can see that the flashlight is showing up in the shot. So uh, we'll do the same thing here. We'll do uh, we'll do lighten. Oops, let's change this layer here. Do lighten, and I'll hide it entirely. Option all, click on the layer mask. I get a black layer mask. And you know, I haven't been zooming in at all on this, but um, I can zoom in and get very detailed about where I want to add that light. So this sort of magically, I can pinpoint the light exactly where I want it. Okay? So now I'm finished with adding the light, but I'm not totally finished because I can now go in and uh, let's say, let's work on this background here. You know, I can see things like, you know, maybe that's too strong. That's too strong the green. So I can reduce the opacity there. Uh, maybe, maybe it shouldn't be green. Okay, so I can, I can take a, and make a, a hue saturation adjustment. Now this hue saturation adjustment is right above that the green layer. If I want it to affect just the layer that's the green layer, 
Here's another secret trick. At the bottom of the layers panel is this little icon here. Looks like a little square with an arrow. Uh, and you'll see if I hover over it, this creates a, uh, a, clicking, a clipping group. If I click on it, now it only adjusts the layer directly below it instead of all the underlying layers. And I can shift the hue around. Let's see. No? I'm not, I'm not shifting that hue because it's in the channel. But I can reduce the saturation of it so it's not quite so so saturated. Make it a little more subtle. Uh, let's actually put an adjustment for all three of those layers in the background group. And let's rotate the hue. So now I can change the hue. I can change the saturation. So the idea is that because all of these lighting are in separate layers, I can come in and manipulate individually the layers to get the effect that I want. So I have complete, in, uh, complete control. So now let's see, what is my timing like? Okay, a little bit more time, right? Cunio, what, when am I, when do I, 10 minutes? 15 minutes, I have 15 minutes, okay. All right, well, let's see. So let me show you some more examples of this kind of lighting that I've done. So uh, here's another example of the RGB kind of lighting into the individual channels. They kind of blend it together and create these sort of interesting lighting effects. Uh, here again, separating white light from the colored light. I can put the colored lights on the background and uh, create the sculptural effects with the individual uh, flashlight layers. Here's one, no, no uh, crazy color, just a really nice lighting on a, on a still life. And uh, I can do very, very specific light, just the strings on the instruments. Uh, there's probably maybe 30 layers in this one of lighting from different directions. So the question now becomes, well, can you use this technique with people? So it's a little more difficult with people because people move and the eye, you have to kind of get them to hold still. So I have this image here and the model is lying on the ground. So she's laying on the ground, the camera's way up there. So I have, you know, with, without a ladder, I can't go up and manipulate the camera, but I have my iPhone out, the Fuji camera remote out. So I can, I can open up the shutter of the camera, walk up to the model, and paint the light on. So she's laying down, it makes it very easy for her to stay still. Her hair is spread out on the, on the ground. So I walk around, you can see now all these individual, you know, painting with light over the subject. And the beauty of it is I don't have to use the whole, that whole exposure, I can just paint in a tiny little bit. So I can create, say, the, 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 the rim of light along her thigh is painted, it's masked so that only that part that I want to see is revealed. So I can get very, very detailed about how I'm lighting this. And I, I use this in, uh, in a tarot card. I'm working on a series of tarot cards. You can go to my website to find out more about this. But I build these elaborate scenes, and I'm starting to use this light painting technique more and more for this uh, to create the kind of surrealistic imagery that I'm going for. Uh, I'm gonna, I have a couple of books, I'll talk about, you know, mention these, and I have some flyers up here that you can come up and uh, find out where I reveal some more techniques here. My Master in Exposure in the Zone System for Digital Photographers. My most famous book and the bestseller is Skin, The Complete Guide to Digitally Lighting, Photographing, and Retouching Faces and Bodies. And these are available on Amazon, you can, you can buy them. 
I have an online course called Photo Illustration. If you go to my website, courses.veris.com, you can find this. Uh, it is uh, I have 15 projects over nine hours of video step-by-step -step instruction to give you the, the, the type of techniques like I was showing today, the light painting technique that's available in this course. So you, you can learn this stuff step-by-step, -step, uh, $99 US. Uh, and do check me out on my website and my YouTube channel. How many minutes do I have left? Five minutes, 10 minutes? 10 minutes, okay. So, one more thing. Everybody wanna see one more thing? Real quick. Okay, we'll go back into Photoshop for one more thing. And I, this is kind of a, this is a fun thing. So here's a, just a, a shot that I'm, I'm walking around in the pier and I see these colored ropes and I take a picture of this. So let's see what we can do with this in Photoshop. Um, so I'm going to open this up into Photoshop to say open the image. Okay, so this is a, I, I like to do, I like to play around with what I call photo montages. So I'm going to duplicate the background and uh, we're going to flip this. So I'm going to transform the image and I'm just going to flip it vertically. Okay, and now we go image canvas size. And I'm going to actually increase the height 200%. So it's twice as, twice as high now. And okay, so I already flipped this background image. I'm just going to add it up here. Okay, so now I have a symmetrical image. Let's flatten that. Let's do the same thing. Duplicate the background. We'll go here, uh, transform, image transform, uh, flip horizontal this time. Canvas size, sorry. So we'll go percentage, 200%. It's twice as wide. Okay. And I move my layer, which has already been flipped. Okay, so now I have uh, kind of a cool symmetrical composition, right? And you can you can make that. That's that's cool the way it is. Let's do one more thing. I'm going to flatten that image. Now I'm going to make it a square. So I'm going to go into image size and uncheck the constraints, and we're going to make it the same size. I'm, and I'm going to shrink it down a little bit here. So we're going to I just type in the same pixel, 65. 28, so it'll be a square. So it's the same size, height, and width. Let's duplicate that. And now I'm going to transform this 90 degrees. And now we can play around. We can go, okay, what is this gonna look like if I lighten it? So now I'm creating what I call my photo mandala. So now this is becomes an abstract image with, with uh, right and left symmetry, or I can say multiply or darken, let's say darken, completely different image, okay? I've given away now two top secret techniques, all for your pleasure today here at Photokina. You can go home and do this on your own, and I believe we're recording these, right? Okay, so Fuji will have all this on their website, I'm sure, at some point. So. Um, Thank you, I think uh, we're pretty much out of time for that. I, I do have little flyers up here if you want to learn more of these kinds of cool things. I'm your guy, so uh, I'll see you, I'll see you all later. And have a great show. <laughs>